we were moving faster than our neighbors in terms of uh, you know privatization and but that's a decision that they made at that time and so we have to live with it now now that new systems are being built one of the issues we're facing in our country is that our power plants are not reliable and it's about time I think we price reliability and, and, and therefore resiliency for resiliency yes. okay yeah. very good Tor, I'd, I'd like to um, come to you, if you don't mind, because you made a, a, a point about uh, essentially the energy system, if you look longer term, is uh, going to do electrons, essentially, and electricity will play a, a more and more important part. And you also made the point about the, uh, the system being very data rich. So that highlighted, and you made the point about cybersecurity. So it'd be interesting, you know, you look at risk, and, you know, so therefore, do we understand cybersecurity? Is it adequately understood by the components of policymakers, uh, the industrialists, and uh, ultimately the consumer as well? And what needs to happen to ensure that we build in resiliency for cybersecurity as we go forward? I'd be interested in some thoughts you have on that. I would just say first that this is not unique to the power industry. We see this in many industries that cybersecurity is actually emerging as a new risk. And, and it's basically because we are getting connected. And, and the connectivity uh, is coming in many industries now. We are seeing the development or evolvement of the Internet of Things. And, and, uh, and that means that it is going to be easier to access components of systems, control systems, all these kinds. It's going to be easier to actually wipe out systems. And, and we see this is uh, starting. We, we see it's already happened to banks and things like that. And, and it will happen in other industries. We need to safeguard against it. It's not, I don't think it's difficult to do it, but we have to do it. And, and in a way, the industry, we have to be smarter than the hackers. Uh, and, and that means that we, we actually have to build more redundancy into our system so that if parts of a system get attacked, we can actually have, have alter, alternative means. Uh, I think we need to move to much more advanced stages of monitoring so that we actually are ahead and can see that, uh, that uh, there are attempts at hacking and things like that. And it's not only taking control of the system, it could also be used to defraud. And, and uh, I'm not saying that you can steal electricity, but you can actually manipulate for monetary gain as well. So I think we would see criminals coming into this as well when they see the opportunities. So, so I'm not saying it's difficult, uh, but, but we need to build our system so that we are resilient against this. Uh, and I think we are still in early days that many industries haven't really started talking, talking about. But it, the last few years, this whole connectivity issue has, has developed fast. And we see even ships being connected today. And we talk about ships and oil rigs also being vulnerable to, to, to uh, attacks because they are connected all the time. Well, uh, you've, you've made my day because uh, I haven't been to a conference over the course of the last year where the Internet of Things hasn't been mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, for me, you were the first mention of it today. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> we only had about 21 minutes left before yes. the IoT had been mentioned. So, um, Mahanda, I'd like to go to you uh, in the context of microgrids, if that's okay. Because um, when I first started looking at energy systems, I'd never heard of microgrids, should we say, seven or eight years ago. And when we think about universal access, um, the emergence of basically unique systems of power generation and access to electricity seem to be very much part of that agenda. And, you know, again, coming from very monolithic grid systems, for example, in my own country, uh, it's been, you know, actually a breath of fresh air sometimes to be involved in some of the projects that uh, you're uh, funding and, and advising on in that way. Um, it is, you know, will we see more of that? But again, you're, the key point I was trying to get at was also the vulnerability of the microgrids to the major events and how do we respond to that. So a little bit about is that the way forward and do we see more of that but does that increase risk into the system uh, in terms of major climatic events that you mentioned or terrorist events that you kind of indicated as well. Okay. Yeah, uh, let me talk about microgrids and I'll come back also to about the, about the pricing of risk and how do we finance it, uh, resilience. Um, microgrids uh, You'll be surprised, microgrids are becoming so popular, uh, not only from the point of view of excess, where grid may take a very long time to reach, uh, particularly in the developing countries, emerging markets, where grid expansion rates have generally been not very fast, and the ability of the state-owned enterprises or the, the, the grid grids is kind of limited because of various reasons, and therefore microgrids are becoming an easier 
uh, more accessible tool for uh, reaching out to the unserved populations much more quickly. But you'll be surprised that microgrids are also becoming very popular as, a matter, as, as, as an adaptation tool. Uh, New Jersey, after this Hurricane Sandy, has created an 80 megawatt. Of course, 80 megawatt is not micro, but in the context of New Jersey, of course, it is <laughs> that they are creating 80 megawatt microgrid because of the, 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 the grid failure that they experienced during the hurricane and getting restoring the system back was took, took so much longer and even the, the critical transport system had to be shut down because they didn't have electricity. So therefore, yes, microgrids are becoming, I mean, will become increasingly popular as a matter of, uh, as, as an instrument for adaptation, right. but also for access. What we have done is that under sustainable energy for all, we have created what we call a high impact opportunity, which is called clean energy mini grids. Right. And that uh, is experimenting with mini grids and micro grids in Africa, uh, and also in, 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 in Bangladesh, uh, that's becoming very popular. And these micro grids actually are becoming economically very viable, uh, because the, 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 the cost of extending the grid is becoming so much, so much higher. Right. But it also then depends on much more of local resource available because sometimes these microgrids are solar or wind or micro hydro or small hydro or biomass available locally. So therefore, uh, they uh, become much more robust, but they also uh, generate more employment and use local resources. And we do see that trend uh, beginning to emerge. All right. If you may allow me for Just coming back to the yeah. issue of, uh, uh, of financing and pricing of uh, resilience, uh, actually there is a big opportunity here. Uh, the IEA's recent estimates of uh, uh, investment which are needed between now and 2035 for three objectives of SE for all, our estimate was that we need to increase the investment from current level of $400 billion to a trillion dollars a year, uh, going up to 2030, 2030. And IEA's estimate is between 48 to $53 trillion uh, in the next 20, year, 20 years, which is two, two and a half trillion dollars a year. By the way, this does not include the cost of adaptation. And that could be, if you, could, if, if the, you were to include that, maybe some of these numbers will go up, but the composition of the investment would change. If you see this $48 trillion, $40 trillion is for the supply and $8 trillion is for energy efficiency. Of this $40 trillion, $20 is for the new investments and $20 is for replacing the aging assets. Yep. And what you heard in the previous session that we need to create five or six Saudi Arabias. I and mean, that is the level of investment that is needed. So this $20 trillion of new investment and $20 trillion of, the, uh, uh, of, of uh, investment for replacement of aging assets creates a huge opportunity for looking at new designs and looking at new technologies and designing it in a way that these can be much more resilient. But the problem is the financing. Okay, um, okay all, right, all right, I'll stop. Sorry. Thank you, Vendor. <laughs> I'll take up the points and sure. we'll continue. Uh, Madam Under Secretary, you mentioned uh, private-public partnerships um, and the importance of those in, in terms of one of the uh, components that came out of the uh, uh, ministers' meeting that you were at recently. Um, I think you know the world is littered uh, with uh, successes and failures of private-public partnerships in terms of the energy system. So, what was the discussion and debate about? What will need to be in place? to make this public-private partnership actually work as far as the investments are concerned. What was the debate around that or any insights on that particular challenge? Well, as I mentioned earlier, our government is instrumental in uh, laying, laying down a level playing field so that investors are, are uh, enticed to um, construct and operate modern uh, energy infrastructure systems uh, because this uh, require massive uh, capital investment. So like if we want to attain uh, an infrastructure that could withstand extreme weather conditions or other natural and man-made disasters, we, we've got to do some vulnerability assessments uh, upgrading of standards so that uh, if our infrastructures are not strong enough or are not um, built to to uh, withstand all these disasters and, and other problems, we, 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 the threats on energy resiliency, 
we, we may not be able to, to attain all of this if investment is missing. So I think it's very critical that trade and in energy trade investments will be given a big focus so that we can finance all these projects. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Agneto, I'm going to return to a, a phrase that I'd never heard before, which is uh, nuclear blue, mm -hmm. so, um, which was uh, an interesting uh, component. And, and the essence, obviously, of the, uh, of the wedge problem or the two-degree problem in terms of uh, looking at uh, ways in which we decarbonize the energy system. And, and obviously, there's a compelling case for most of us who are involved in energy with regard to nuclear. But the fact of the matter is, um, it has been challenged, but do you see that changing? Again, you know, two to three years ago, it was very difficult to get nuclear on the agenda sometimes, but there does seem to be a bit of a change in the way in which nuclear is now being looked at, as it really is seen as part of the answer as we go forward. Is, is that me being a little bit naive, or is that a genuine uh, place that we're in at this moment in time? I think it's uh, moving forward in many parts uh, of the world. I, I see there is a big interest in nuclear in uh, many emerging countries and also in, in uh, developing economies. And also there is a few parts of the world where you do not discuss nuclear. You avoid to discuss it because it's uh, a political unstable situation. Uh, though the public is, uh, is uh, clear on that. And I would like to say also, because in certain parts of the world we don't have to discuss air pollution so much anymore, and um, still it is very important. So when I go back now to nuclear blue and the weather again, and it's, um, air pollution is, according to the World Health Organization, killing seven million people per year roughly. And also Mahindra mentioned this, that some is for indoor pollution. But so for me, the priority is to deal with energy poverty because that's really killing people immediately. Hmm. And uh, then uh, to uh, deal with air pollution, which also we give respiratory diseases and, and also kill people. And then in the future, that will jeopardize the whole world is the climate change. So all these things come together and are important. That's why nuclear need to be discussed together with the other energy sources. And nuclear is uh, also, like in UK, discussed also when it comes to skills and all the extra values it's giving, not only the clean air, but also developing skills and giving stability to the system, and in fact enabling the, the renewables that are intermittent. Okay, thank you for that. Um, a question um, I suppose I, I just have to the panel and, and anyone to respond to it, but um, one of the uh, components uh, that has been talked about today was, I think, Mahindra, your, your point, which was regard to um, your ability to respond to uh, major um, resilience events. Uh, in other words, the uh, rapid response capability that needs to be in place. Is, is, is there a best practice for that? Or, you know, is this just wishful thinking at the moment? Or are governments, and would you, you know, if you can mention any that are, are taking some good steps on that that could act as, a, as an analog for other states to think about as well? So I'd be interested in any thoughts you have on that. Um, that's something very new. I mean, we have had uh, uh, emergency preparedness or the disaster uh, response for, um, for, for some, um, in, you know, one component of the system. Uh, for example, a hydro plant. If, whenever you build a new hydro project, you always have an emergency response. Nuclear, you always have an emergency response. But that is only yeah, for, a a, for, for yeah. one component of the energy system. But when you have a catastrophic event, the whole energy system gets, gets affected by that. And we don't have that. Uh, preparedness because we don't have a good understanding mm -hmm. of w what kind of damage does it cost, does it cause, and how do we respond to that? Is it a technical response in terms of the utility or the oil of the gas company responding to it, or is it that we look at look at the whole system, whole system of the of the government, uh, the transportation, the water supply and sanitation, the medical services, that you look at the whole. I, I look at that in a more comprehensive way and make sure that these systems are designed in a way that they can respond so that they are trained and they're aware and they're trained and the public is also involved in that awareness. That kind of technology, that kind of understanding doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It doesn't today. exist. Okay. Uh, very, very little. Now but, we're beginning but you to would argue it. this is an important component this that governments need to think about as we go forward. Uh, if you want to reduce the social impact and the social uh, pain of these uh, catastrophic uh, events, which you can't avoid, then you have to uh, start paying attention to preparing these uh, uh, societies. For Very good. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
We do have uh, questions that have, uh, have come through, so um, uh, to make sure that I, uh, I deal with these properly, there are uh, three votes uh, on this one. And uh, under the UNFCCC, the Green Climate Fund, uh, the uh, GCF, could address vulnerability and adaptation issues. How much can ASEAN tap into these funds? Would it be in the form of, of grants or loans? Are you qualified, man? I wouldn't hesitate, but I, I hope if there's somebody from GCF can respond to that. Um, but uh, GCF is something very new. Uh, they have been on the books for a while, but they are still getting their act together. They have got some funding now. Uh, and uh, the very first uh, spate of uh, the, the projects were recently considered by the board, and the next tranche would be coming. So they do have they are creating these windows, they are at the very early stages, but they are creating these windows uh, uh, for, for, for uh, um, which could be for mitigation, but also for uh, adaptation. Uh, how, to, how to access that? Uh, you can look at their website and you can get information on this. Those methodologies and those procedures are at a nascent stage and they're still evolving it. Uh, hopefully, very quickly, now that they have got more funding, they should be able to stabilize that and become more fully operational. Uh, I hope they don't criticize me for what I'm saying here. But <laughs> okay. uh, yes, they, they, they are at an early stage of operationalization. Very good. Uh, Agneta, the um, question that's uh, specifically for you. Okay. Uh, is waste to energy considered as a viable solution to control the global temperature within the two degrees limit? Uh, any baseload power plant better than nuclear? You can see the, uh, the question in front of you there. Okay. Um, I think we need all energy sources that are low carbon and um, all of them contribute in their way and uh, we need to have also the stability of the system. So waste to energy is used a lot in, uh, in for instance, Sweden, where I come from, so I have good experience to do that. And uh, it is, of course, reducing emission, em emissions, but otherwise it will be dumped somewhere else. So this is seemed to be a viable option uh, in some countries. But I do believe we, we need to have them all solutions, and they may, it has to be adapted to in which part of the world they are. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask uh, each of the, uh, the panels just uh, uh, one question and uh, get their response to this um, to try and bring together the uh, the session that we have. Um, so Aaron, I'm going to start.